favorite definition of salvation. My favorite definition of salvation is one starving man finding the bread and going to tell another starving man where he found the bread. So now I want to add a little bit to that. Who is the bread of life? Jesus. Jesus is the bread of life. Life. So, so if you say that, one starving man finding Jesus and then telling someone else where to find Jesus. That's our mission as Christians, right? So today, I'm the starving man. I have found Jesus. I have found Jesus a long time ago, but Jesus has come fresh and anew to me recently. So my purpose today is to tell you how I found Jesus. How I found the bread and to help you get hungry. I want to make you hungry. Jesus. Are you with me? Yeah. Now I'm going to talk about a lot of stuff, so I need, need you to really focus today <laughs> and pay attention. Can you guys hear look him me okay? in the eyes, and I'll look you in the eyes, and we'll, we'll try to um, get through this. So my testimony starts, of course, with my, we all know that I, about a year and a half ago, I went through a bone marrow transplant. And God miraculously healed me. And you, you were so instrumental in your support Amen. and your help for me to get through that. And so it's just been exciting. I thank God every day for my healing. And I just want to thank you. And so my perception was I would, I would be healed and come home and live happily ever after. I was ready for a fairy tale. But unfortunately, <laughs> I came home and I was healed and thankful, but the happily ever after didn't quite work. You know, I, I came home and I was really weak, really sick from being through all that. I had no idea how weak and how sick I was. You don't, because you, you know, you're used to a concept when you get sick, you know, a couple of days later you bounce back, a week later you bounce back, or two weeks, <laughs> but this was not. You know, I went for the bone marrow, they basically did the bone marrow within the first 10 days to transplant. And then the rest of the time, so the 90 days after that, I was there just recovering enough so I could come home and be immune enough, develop enough immune systems so that I could survive back in the world. But the process wasn't over. I thought, you know, well, now I'm healed, I'm done, I'm, I'm ready to go. But it didn't, didn't work that way. So I spent time alone, a lot of time alone, partially because I couldn't do anything else. I was still struggling. I can remember times getting up and going to the kitchen. I'm going to go. I, I had all these great ideas in my mind. I'm going to go make myself some food. And I get out to the kitchen and think, well, now in order to start this, you got to bend over and pick up that pan. I go, eh, I, I, I can't do that. I'm going to go back to bed. Literally, that's what would happen. So it was a long process. <clears throat> And so in that process, you know, you spend that much time alone, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm just alone because of what I'm going through. But you get lonely and you start thinking, you know, this isn't what I had planned. What the, what's happened here? This is not. This is not living happily ever after. So you go through that long enough and you start saying, is this ever going to end? And you begin to wonder. And then you go to the next question, there's got to be more in life. God, you didn't save me to come vegetate in my bedroom. There's got to be more in life. And so mix in with that all the feelings that you're going through, you know, you, in your delusional state, I could say, I'm feeling abandoned. 
I'm feeling lonely. I, I, you know, I questioned everything because I just couldn't understand why this was happening to me. And so I began to plead to God, say, God, help me. You know, explain, I don't understand, God, you healed me, so why did you heal me if this is what my life is going to be? And so for a lot of time, it took, uh, this took, it wasn't just a couple weeks, this is months. This is month after month I'm saying, God, why, why am I living this way? This doesn't make any sense to me. And then I started pleading to God and saying, there's something wrong with them. Why don't they love me? It's all about them. Here I am, I'm a sick man, I'm healed, and now everybody's abandoned me. What's wrong with them? And then somewhere along that process, God started speaking to me and said, you know, Bruce, it's not about them. It's about you. No matter what the question is, it always comes back to me. Because I can't do anything about you. The only person I can control is me. So I begin to understand there's something wrong with me, but I had no idea. No, absolutely no idea how to fix it. I'm going, there's something wrong with me, but I don't, I don't have a clue. So what am I going to do? So I'm still pleading. I'm still asking and not getting any answers. I'm getting frustrated. I'm getting stronger, but I'm, I'm feeling defeated. And this, so, you know, I came home in probably, what was it, November? And so this is going, now we're all the way to August, and we go to London. And I'm still struggling with these feelings. June? It was June we went to August. That's why she's here. So, <laughs> We went to London. What did I say? Yeah, so not August, June, we went to London. So I'm still struggling. And I go to London with Connie, and this is going to be a fantastic trip because she's going to speak, and we're going to have some time to, to visit London. We've never been to London before, and so we're all excited about that. And we get there, and the time she's speaking... I'm, I'm a dead weight. She's hauling me. She's got all this stuff to take care of, the planning, the scheduling, all the details of doing this, and I'm just, just barely able to function. Or, you know, I'm functioning, but I'm not contributing anything. So I feel like dead weight because I was dead weight. And so that just, you know, so I, I just increased. This is getting more and more frightened. You can understand. I'm more and more frustrated about that. So while we were in London, I got the awesome, we got the awesome opportunity to meet Nicky Gumbel. He is the author of Alpha. We're going to talk about that later. And he's also the author of this Bible, the commentary for this Bible, One Year Bible with his commentary. And we met him, and Connie got to visit with him for an hour. And she gave her, him her book, and he gave us his book in return. And so we come back, and after we get back, I think, you know, well, that's something I would like to do is read through the Bible in a year because my devotion time was sporadic because it was hard to read, it was hard to focus. And so I thought, this is, I'm going to do this. And so I started every morning getting up and reading my devotion. And it didn't take long, I fell in love with it. And I started finding little breadcrumbs because I'm looking for the bread. I'm looking for Jesus, so I found some breadcrumbs in the devotions and started adjusting my thinking. And one of the best things I found was one day he said, you need to come out of the shadows and let Jesus shine his light into your life. 
And so I didn't, I didn't have a big oh wow moment, but that, that registered, registered with me that I need to come out of my shadows. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So, so things are progressing. I'm starting to feel more and more alive. And then in December, I still go back to Mayo for checkups every couple of months. And so we were back to Mayo. And I, I just want to share a little bit about with Mayo. So be patient with me because this is really important. When we went to Mayo, we spent three months there. We get, spent three months at Mayo. Every day I'd go to Mayo for, for checkups for, for the first two months, every day. And I'd be there all day. And so we got to learn about Mayo and their culture there. And we found it to be an amazing culture. Mayo was started by a doctor back in the 1800s. His sons took over his practice and created a hospital. And to find nurses for the hospital, they contacted the Catholic diocese there, St. Francis, to get nuns to be, doc to be nurses in the hospital. And so together, they formed a unity, a dedication to excellence. Not just excellent medicine, but excellence in how they treat people, how they respect people, and how they work. And you see that culture in every aspect of Mayo. For three months, I observed that. And it, be, it just really became a marvel. And then after we'd been there a couple of months, we realized that not only was Mayo creating that culture in the hospital, but that culture actually spread into the city of Rochester. Because Mayo is such a big part. And Rochester is only a city of about 100,000. So Mayo is a huge part of Rochester. And so that culture was spread into to, to Rochester. And during that time up there, Connie and I would talk about that. And we were convinced that, I don't think, we were challenged. That's a better word. We were challenged that if a hospital can create that strong of a culture that it can influence a city, why can't we as a church create a culture so strong that we can affect our city? Are you getting that? Why can't we create a culture that can affect our city? And so we went back to Mayo in December, and now I'm starting to get the light, and I I get reminded of that challenge that we had talked about when I was there as a patient. We want to go back to Lincoln and Radiant Church and create a culture that will light the church on fire and in return light the city on fire. We can do that. We can do that. Where is it going to start? How is it going to start? The first place it has to start is in each individual's heart. We have to rediscover Jesus and make him the primary source of our, of our strength. He's our bread. How does he give us, you know, we say the truth. The truth is the Bible. If you have a question, you find the answer in the Bible. Now, the Bible doesn't tell you what should you do about transgender? But the Bible tells you the truth. And from that truth, you can figure out what to do about stuff like that. So, but if you don't know the truth, you don't have the answers. When I was teaching school in Arizona, I had the opportunity to, to work with students that have that have either flunked out or been kicked out of school. And so they came to this charter school, which is a, almost a private school, but still funded by the government. But these are the people that have been kicked out of school or been, I quit school. And so this is the last hope. They came every day for four hours 
and sat in front of a computer and did their classwork. And my job was to facilitate that. Now, in a very easy way, I can tell you my job was to keep them from killing each other. That's all I did is keep them from killing each other. It just had to have some kind of discipline. Because you're putting a person in front of a computer for four hours that can hardly read, doesn't want to read, wants to do anything except the, their job, and so I'm constantly just, you know, trying to encourage them. And kind of can tell you, the first year, I came home, I'd been to war all day. And you won't believe what happened today. You won't believe what they said to me. I can't believe these guys. These guys are crazy. So after the first year, I had looked for a job, and this was the only job I could find. So I was desperate. So I just kept my nose down and kept working. So I came back in, in, in the summer of the first year. I had an opportunity to be exposed to love and logic, which is a, a system to how to maintain control in the classroom. Love and logic. Love. So the main theme is you have to create love in your classroom. And I go through the training, and they say, you know, we're going to teach you how to love your students. <laughs> I, I, I do not want to love these students. I might go out and beat them to death, but I do not love these students. I don't want to love these students. These people are terrible. But through the training, you learned how to control the classroom and how to create an a, a, a atmosphere of love. You didn't, I never used the word love because I can honestly tell you I never loved them the way they thought I should love them. But I cared about them. And so I wanted to improve the environment. One of the basics of love and logic is that as a teacher, you should never get into an argument with the student. If the student begins to argue, you just say to them, I love you too much to argue. Now, I never said that. But I could say, I care too much to argue with you. I don't, I, a lot of times I'll just say, I don't argue. And in front of my classroom, class was until 2 o'clock, so in front of my classroom I had a sign that said, I would be glad to argue at 2.15. So you have to come and argue on your time, not my time. And I never had an argument. Because nobody were going to stay till 2.15. As soon as that 2 o'clock was done, all their concerns were over. They're gone. So I never had to argue. But the reason they gave you that philosophy of the teacher never argues is because when you argue with someone, you come down to their level. And then you lose the argument because of experience. They're more experienced, and so they just... And so as Christians, what have we done? We have, instead of dealing with people in love, we have come down and tried to argue with them. A good example is the abortion issue. We want to explain to them how abortion is evil, how bad it is. They're not interested in that. They're interested in what's best for me, because that's what the devil does to us, right? And so we have to learn to speak in love. The church has to learn to speak in love. So how is we as a church can we start to learn to speak in love? We had this class called, we are in the process of studying the five love languages that's created by God. So what we're trying to do is teach us how to love each other, how to better understand. It's not that we aren't good, it's not that we're bad, it's not that we're evil, but we, everybody can learn to love better. Is that right? And so we're setting the foundation, learn to love. So have you ever Bend around a person is like sandpaper when you get around them. They just rub you the wrong way. 
And you just go, that may be a Christian, but I don't hang with them, you know? Think about this. Do you ever think that maybe God put that sandpaper next to you to rub off your edges? If we can't love a Christian brother or sister that's in a church, how are you going to reach the world? How is God going to bring people into our church so that we can love them? We can't even love the people that are here. I hear constantly that somebody will ask, you know so-and-so, and all they sit on the other side of the church. How far is it from this side to that? How long does it take you? you? They've been here two years. You haven't been able to walk across the room and just say hi to them, introduce yourself, and start a relationship? We have to get over ourselves. It's not about us. It's not about our pleasure. It's about sharing the love of Jesus, helping to learn how to Give bread to a starving man. This world is starving. This world is dark. Every week, every day you can go by and see how the world is getting darker. I would never have believed what has happened in the last couple of years could happen in America. Never. Never. And it's happening. It's getting worse every day. Who can change can you, let me give you a quote. Well, I don't have to look at it. Martin Luther King said, darkness can never drive out darkness. Only the light can. Hate can never drive out hate. Only love can. So we're talking about two things. We're talking about light and we're talking about love. Who is the light? We are. Because we get our message from the Bible. We get our message from Jesus. We get the light from Jesus. We have to share that light. If the world is dark, it's because we haven't been the light. It's not, I'm not condemning anyone. I'm just, I'm just, this is, this is what I have been learning. So I'm just sharing with you what I have learned. And how can we share the light? We can't share the light by being condemning, criticizing, and arguing, and telling everybody we're better because we have Christ. They don't care. This generation doesn't even know what, you know, we grew up in, I should say some of us, some of us older people, grew up in a, in a world where if you said something about the Bible, everybody gave that as confirmation, but now you talk about the Bible and say, oh, I don't believe the Bible. The Bible is just a bunch of fairy tales. So you can't rely on that. We have to be able to approach them at their level and show them love. Love. So we can't, if we, if we go and criticize, condemn, and think we're better than them, who are we? Who are we acting like? Who did Jesus complain about in the Bible? That's right. The Pharisees. So if we go out and they knew all the laws, they knew what was right, but they didn't, they didn't give it in love. They gave it in criticism. Did it work? They were so blind they couldn't even see Jesus when he's standing right there in front of them. So we cannot be Pharisees. I asked Connie if we could make some T-shirts. It said, Radiant Church... No Pharisees allowed. <laughs> and she, she vetoed that. Can you believe that? She didn't want that. So we go to Mayo. I get reminded of the, of the culture. I come back, and we start studying the five languages of love. And there was an explosion in my heart and in my soul. 
all of a sudden things started falling in place. There were things that, you know, it wasn't that I didn't know about these things. Like, I knew about love and logic. I knew that, you know, you should approach people in love. And I learned some principles that I use in the classroom, but I was too stubborn, too naive, too ignorant to apply that to the rest of my life. But now, all of a sudden, I'm learning them again. I learned them in affirmation just was like a... You know, I grew up in a world where I was never affirmed by anybody. And it, it's okay, because that was more than, they, you know, my parents were not capable of that, because what they were worried about was putting a house over our head and food on the plate. And my dad worked every day hard to do that, and he gave me that work ethic. And so I thank him for that. So I don't criticize my parents because they couldn't do, they couldn't do what they didn't know. So it's, it's okay. I'm not going to blame them for that. But now we have a new light. We have a better way of doing things. And so we need to incorporate that. And so that's why desperately I've been asking people to join the five languages of love. Because we, what we're doing here is we're trying to change the culture of the church. And if we're going to change that, we need everyone to understand where we're going. Everyone to understand, everyone to get that revival in my heart. I can tell you, my heart, you know, I never understood when people said, oh, my heart is just on fire. My heart's on fire. I never understood. There's just so much joy. My, I have joy in my life. And I found that, you know, some of the things when I grew up, you know, I told you I didn't get affirmed, so I never knew how to affirm anybody. I lived with a lady. I married a lady that affirmed people all the time. But I may, I'm slow, but I'm, I'm not stupid. And at some point, it just fin I finally understood and just do some simple steps in the five languages of love taught me you can do this. You can do this. You start where you're at. It doesn't matter if you can't carry on a conversation for more than two seconds. Everybody's capable of walking up to the same and say, Hi, my name is Bruce. What's your name? And then you say, Tell me about yourself. Tell me how you got to Radiant Church. What do you do? And so the whole time I'm talking to someone, my mind is going, keep them talking about themselves, because you don't want to have to talk, so just keep them talking. And it, that'll, it'll start. It's a place to start. And the other part, they said, is start where you're at. So it doesn't matter. And I continue from zero to one. You may be one, you may be eight, but wherever you're at, start it. And the other part is to be direct. Don't be passive. You know, like when we have fellowship dinner, we always encourage you to sit with somebody you don't know. How many of you have gone out there and found a seat and say, Lord, I pray that you bring somebody that I don't know to sit at my table. And the whole time you're praying, you're keeping your head down, making sure not to make eye contact with anyone lest someone come and sit with you. And then at the end of the meal, you say, well, the Lord must not want anybody to sit with me because he didn't bring anybody by. You can't do it passively. You have to be direct. You have to go and say, hey, I want you to sit with me today. Will you do that? Can I sit with you? And then just start the conversation. Let them, let them talk about themselves. It's not, if I can do it, if I can do it, you can do it. If I can do it, can you do it, Glenn? Yeah. So it's really, we have to start. But the place it starts, where it started for me, was with the hunger. I think, you know, I look back now, and I think that God put me in that place. 
I think of the whole illness. I think of all that happened and all that cycled through is God put me in a place where he said, you know, I came home and said, I'm healed. Let's get on with the show. And God said, not yet. We got work to do. And so he used those months. I'm not talking about, again, I'm not talking about a couple of days. Months of me pleading, begging, and getting desperate and saying, God, I can't live like this anymore. I can't live like that anymore. How many of you can say that? I don't want to live like this anymore. I want your love and your life in my life. Do you think God will ignore that prayer? He won't. He might not answer it tomorrow. He might not answer it next week. He may not answer it next month. But it took me months and months of praying that, but he answered it. He answered it, and now I'm transformed. Every day I get up and say, I said, God, please don't take this away. Please, please give me more. Give me more. And you know, I look at my, I look at my time I spent on, you know, the, these new phones, they tell you how much time you spend every week. My time is going down. It's not because I've white knuckled and say, I'm just not going to get on the phone. I'm not going to do that because that's a waste of time. Because I got better things to do. My time is going down because I, I don't want to spend time there. I got better things. I got some bread I can go eat. I got some things that are going to help me that I can do. Am I perfect? Only in my mind. <laughs> but no, I'm not perfect. But God is helping me. God is with me. So we started with the five languages of love. So that's how we're going to start. You first have to, how are you going to reach people? Through love and through the light, right? Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only the light can. That was what I was stuck on. So we have to have the light. The light comes from studying the word. So we studied love. We're trying to help you learn to love each other better so that you can love everyone better. Now the next step is we're going to begin to study the word. And how we're going to do that is through Alpha. Alpha is created by the same person that wrote Nicky Gimbel. By the same person, Nicky Gimbel, that wrote the Bible that I fell in love with. So I'm excited. I'm excited to get into Alpha. I want you to join me in Alpha. I want every one of you to come and join me in Alpha. I want you to find out about Christ again. Find out, I know you know this stuff. I know that you've been raised, if you've been raised in church 50 years, I know you know it. I know that you can understand it, but I want you to understand it better. Just like what I said. I knew some of this stuff, but now my understanding is new. At the right time and right place, God revealed himself and showed me his, his understanding. Are you with me? I'm not going to ask you to. I'm not. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or to raise your hand. Or, I just want you to. We all have 168 hours in the week. What is the most important thing in your life? What is the most important thing in life? Is getting a relationship with God. I want to ask you how many hours of that week do you spend? alone getting in touch with God? Is it two hours on Sunday morning? Don't forget Alpha. Huh? I'm, okay. I'm getting there. <laughs> or is it how much time? 
I want you to make a commitment not to me, because I don't, it doesn't matter to me. I want you to sit here and make a commitment to God. You know, God, I, first I want you, if you believe that, if you think that, that I don't want to live like this anymore. I just gave you the solution. So I want you to say, I understand the solution. I'm ready to commit more of my life to that. Now, when you get your paycheck every month or every week, do you, what's the first thing you do? Probably one of the first things you do is pay your rent or pay your mortgage, right? Because that's important. So when you get up in the morning, what's the first thing you should be doing is spending time with God, because that's important. When I get up in the morning, that's the first thing I do because that sets my day. Sets my day for the whole day, and I can, I can, I find that I can live in that shine all day long, in the glow, in that spirit, that bubbling feeling that comes up in my heart, and I live in that all day long. So I just ask you to commit to time. Let the Holy Spirit tell you. The Holy Spirit was sent by Jesus to speak to us, and he will speak to us.